Eric Gerson, it is wonderful to be connected. Thank you so much for joining me for this interview about the top 10 traits of highly resilient people. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm excited, and in case anybody hears, my St. Bernard is outside barking and excited as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, we welcome pets, and uh, actually I know that you, as the manifesting medium, you have special communication skills with animals as well, right? Yeah, that, that definitely happens. It started happening actually with my St. Bernard about three or four years ago. Because every time I, uh, you know, before, before, before bed, I'll, I'll lay down with each of the three dogs, and I'll lay down with them and put my head to their head and everything. And just one day, all of a sudden, Fluffy is his name. Uh, one day, he just started talking to me. And, you know, I started wondering, you know, what, you know am I right? Am I still okay? You know? But then he started telling me things that were going to happen or actions that I needed to take. And he's, he was never wrong. Wow. And so that, that really was my initial introduction kind of to recognizing in my own life that I'd been talking to spirit for my entire life and like my mother used to call it you know your little voice you know yeah. that little that, that little, everybody's got that little voice that's all the way in the back of the room that you always if you end up at the end of the day saying why didn't i listen yeah and yep and so he would just start talking to me and and so i kind of tested it out a few times be like all right well what about this and ask you know legit questions and and the dog is always right so <laughs> <laughs> So it kind of started like that, uh, and now it's kind of morphed into where I can, I can, you know, they'll, they'll talk to me, and I can, I can, they'll tell me what's wrong with them, and then I can use uh, through energy work and uh, kind of a manifesting intention, I can, I can get them, you know, help help get them healed. Wow. Well, I love how you have the mind and the spirit and the body connection really working for you, and I was so struck by the story that you share in the book, the top 10 traits of highly resilient people, like you really talk about how life could just throw you curveballs and brick walls and somehow you manage to maneuver around them, turn situations to your advantage. Like it's, it's pretty cool. So is that your brain or is it spirit? Is it intuition? Like I know you have this quote unquote proofreading ability. Like what is it? Well, I, it's, it, it's like I, I talk to Karen about it all the time. It's like, this is how my brain works. It, it never stops. And, and it's always looking at every situation, and it, it just finds unique ways around things or through things or however you want to phrase it. Um, and I don't look back with regret. Mm. And that, that's a big thing. And, I, and, I, and it, it's taken me a long time in my life to actually realize that, not everybody's like that. <laughs> you know, a lot of times I would I would work through a situation and be like, all right, everybody, let's go. And everybody's still kind of like, hey, wait a minute, we're still processing this. It was kind of taking a long time for me to realize, you know, okay, not everybody's thinking that same way. Um, you know, it, it's it, it's just I look at life a lot differently than a lot of people that I've known. To me, there's no starting point, there's no ending point. Is that every individual thing that happens to you it's just this step along a journey. And the, the reason I don't look back with regret is because anybody, I like to call it reverse engineering your life. And if, if you look back far enough, you can find something that you did where in the moment it seemed like a terrible decision. And even the initial, the initial consequence of that action was, was terrible. But as you extrapolate out further and further, what happened as a result of that decision, you eventually get all the way back to where, well, that, that, that was the right thing. That you know, I'm, 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 that led me to where I am now, and I'm happy with where I am now. Therefore, there's, there's no regret for any of it. Well, that is a very mature perspective. <laughs> um, you know, and I think I, I think I'm there-ish now, but it definitely has taken time. And, and just the, the, the gift of hindsight to be able to look back on my life and recognize, you know what, there was a guiding force or presence with me all along. And even though I may have thought I screwed up or why was life doing this to me, there really was a, a divine plan unfolding. So tell us about this proofreader story because I do want to understand how your, your brain works. 
All right, well, it's a little bit mischievous because it's a, it's a kind of, it's a little bit about my father, and he, he, he doesn't like this story, but I can't repeat here what he says when I tell the story. So when I was a young kid in my teens and 20s, they owned a print shop. And it's kind of, you know, it's long before computers and everything. So it was, it was standard issue. You had your printing presses and the ink went on the plate. And so if you ran four color work, you ran it one color at a time. So each color had to lay on top of the previous color perfectly. My job was, the, was to be the proofreader. So to, to, to approve the type and everything like that. So a lot of times I ended up being the proofreader for the proofreaders where a half dozen different people could look at the job and approve it and it'd be running then i'd come in from wherever i was and take a sheet out of the press and be like stop just stop and because my eyes would just immediately scan and i'd find all these typos but my father was the one who you would bring the job to if you were running color work because he had to approve if the colors were lined up exactly so long story short that this this dynamic kept happening between the other pressmen and my father where the pressman would bring him this piece of paper that they knew was on. They knew that it was as perfect as you could get. And my father would look at it with his magnifying glass and tell him, ah, move, move the red, move the cyan, move the magenta, move, just, just change it a little bit, move it a little bit. And they'd start arguing back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. So this one day, and the rooms were separate. The press room was different from where my dad was, so he couldn't really see what we were doing. So... This one day, this happens between this pressman, Ramon, and my dad, and they're just going back and forth. And Ramon comes into the press room, slams the door, and him and I had about an eight-minute conversation, and he was just frustrated, could not figure out how he was going to get my father to change. I said, bring them the same sheet of paper. So, my, so, so the pressman had just come out of the room with this sheet of paper where my dad insisted he had to move the yellow. Had to move the yellow. It, it, it's got to happen. So we had this conversation. I said, why don't you just go sit, go give him the same sheet of paper. Ramon just kind of looked at me like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> he walked into the other room, gave my dad the same exact sheet, sheet of paper. Dad looked at it with the magnifying glass. Good. That's perfect. Great. Thanks. Appreciate it. <laughs> and and on. Of that story, he went. He went too pleased. <laughs> but but it was a way to say, okay, this issue, this problem, this is not changing. So how can I get around this to get to where I want and where I need to be? And so that that's kind of how my brain will work. Yeah. Well, you definitely have that trait of adaptability. Um, you right. know, which is such an important trait for resilience. It's if we get too locked on and rigidly stuck in having our way, then we will break at some point. But having that flexibility and that adaptability like you do, um, you know, like telling the story of, of how you developed this eBay business and all of the twists and turns. I won't give away all of the, the, all of the goods, but it's amazing that, that you have been able to maintain that and then even and heighten your sense of, of being in tune with trends and spirit. Well, I, th I think the thing is, is since I don't look back with regret, I'm comfortable looking back. You know, a lot of times people are like, I don't even want to think about that. I don't even want to think about what, ha what happened. I don't want to, want to remember certain things that happened. Um, you know, there's a story where my, I, my first pair of dogs, uh, my first dog I had, his name was Beezer. And the last couple of years of his life, he had a lot of hip and joint problems. And so every night before he went, would go to bed, I'd get him with the massager. I had the big massager and I'd massage his legs and he'd lay there and he loved it. He loved it. And this was during the time was I was in massage school and I came home from massage school one day and he, had, he, he wasn't, he hadn't passed, but he had something that obviously happened. So long story short, I took him to the vet the next morning and found out he had lymphatic cancer. And I had been spreading it by giving him the massages. And we had to put him down that day. Oh. Right. So things like that, when that happens, a lot of times people would be like not wanting to go back 
and learn from them. And that took a long, long time to get over. And through a, through a, through a completely separate series of events that if taken individually, they would seem extraordinarily self-destructive. But through that series of events, I ended up with my St. Bernard Fluffy, who happens to be the same spirit of the dog, <laughs> Beezer. Oh, wow. So he came back. Oh. He came back. But the circumstances that led to me finding him, at least three or four things, it was three or four individual things that happened that were all terrible. They were all terrible, self-destructive things that led me back to him. Wow. So, so when a lot of times people will block themselves by thinking, I have to stop this certain behavior, or why do I always do this? Why? Well, it's because you're designed a certain way. And just, just follow what spirit's laying out for you, and eventually you're going to get to that point where you realize why you went through all that struggle. Wow. Again, I mean, your story just keeps reinforcing that it takes a certain amount of faith, faith in oneself, faith in the universe, faith in spirit, that we can get to a, a happy destination without as much struggle. Like one of the things that I think is really um, telling about the work that you do is that you do have also this ability to manifest. So it's not just that you adapt to whatever life throws at you. You're also really tuned into this law of attraction and manifesting. And you also, if I understand correctly, you knew that you were going to be connected to your current life partner before all of that happened. And I know that you're also going to be sharing that story in one of our other books called Manifesting Love. But you've got to tell us a little bit about that because your work as the manifesting medium is pretty epic. Well, um, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a funny story because, well, I don't want to tell the ending first. But I, I, I have, where, where, I, where I live, I have a nice piece of land. And I've probably got about an acre fence then where the dogs are with me and I can go outside and walk around and there's trees and everything like that. But I have a fire pit. It's a real, you know, not, it's not pre-made. It's, it's, you know, branches and everything. And so when I go out a lot of times to manifest something, I'll just walk circles around the pit, just walk and, and, and you know, get in my head what I want and just continue to repeat it. Well, it was during a time when, you know, my marriage was basically over and, living by myself and I just went out there one day I, I honestly don't remember the exact circumstances that led me to get to this point of frustration which that's a whole other subject where like points of frustration the perfect time to go out there and manifest mm. and yelling at spirit but that's a different story so when I went out there and for whatever reason I was frustrated and basically my whole idea was like look if you guys got somebody for me and you're going to point me in that direction of what I need to do. I need, I now, now is when the gate enough playing around. I've had enough. I need an answer. Now I'm walking around this fire. I'm saying, you guys got to send me somebody. If, if there's somebody center now, sure enough in the fire, I see Karen's face. Now I didn't know who she was at this point, but clear as day, I saw her. Wow. And it wasn't but a couple of days later, I don't want to give away the whole story, it wasn't a couple of days later I was made aware of her and quite literally her picture was what I saw in the fire. Wow. And so the ending, not the ending, but when, whenever Karen and I are, are talking and she's like, well, this is the answer, how do you know? How do you know? I'm like, because I saw you in the fire before I even knew who you were. It's like, I'm going to roll with that answer. <laughs> So the spirit shows you somebody in a fire, that's the, they, 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 they're coming. They're, they're coming, you know, keep them around. Exactly, because it's not something that you fabricated yourself. It wasn't that, like you, you were specifically looking for a certain type. It just, it, it was shown to yeah. you. So tell us a little bit about the work that you and Karen are doing, because it is also, again, very unique, and it ties into this story of resilience. Yeah, um, yeah, unique is definitely the worst. <laughs> Between the two of us, I mean, we, we've sat around for six months, and that's how we kind of finally got to the manifesting medium, is because we sat around for so long, it's like, 
well, what do we call it? What do we call it? We didn't want to call it this and that and all these commercialized words. And finally, I just had to get to the point of frustration again one day. I was like, you know what? Fine, I'm a medium. Whatever. I own it. Fine. Okay. Just, let's just call it what it is. And But it's not a medium in a traditional sense. I, I like to say, if you're looking for grandma's cookie recipe, I'm not your guy. <laughs> and <laughs> what the... the contrast between what I do and what Karen does is it's a perfect match because I was a former massage therapist and then I became a life coach because talking to my clients I, I kind of got into that work and and then like we talked about all of a sudden I started to realize I had been speaking to spirit and then I developed or I guess the, the, the ability was awoken in me you might want to say uh, to have the spirits of the deceased start talking to me so I started having experiences there where I was getting messages for people and 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 that's the most difficult part for me is is the way it works for me and this is how it ties in with Karen's experience with her illness and and with how she verbalizes things I get I get what you don't really it's on the border of what you really want to hear and what you don't want to hear if you go deep enough you'll be like yeah, yeah I kind of kind of thought that, I kind of knew that, but what spirit will give me, I argue with you all the time, I'll argue with your spirit, I'll argue with dog spirit, I'll argue because they'll be like, say this, and I'll be like, you want me to say what? <laughs> and they just give me a blank stare, like, you want me to say what? They're like, don't listen to me, fine, I'm like, okay, fine, I'm listening, so I'll say it, that thing that I don't want to say, and immediately you'll just see the, the reaction wash over the client. Wow. And you know that you you've gotten all the way to the bottom, and then that's where Karen comes in because she's the lifeboat. <laughs> she she's the lifeboat because you know I kind of I kind of will drag it up and drag it out of you and put the entire thing on the table there. Karen is the one that helps you make sense of it all. It helps you kind of get to that place where the kind of where I naturally am. We're like, okay, here's where, how we're gonna take. What, what you found out, what you relearned about yourself and, and and apply it to what's going on in your past and forgive yourself for some of the things that you think maybe you did wrong while also finding an ability to move forward. And, 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 that, and it really works because once you get to this space where you're not being so hard on yourself about what happened in the past and, and you're not regretting and, and you really understand where some of these things that come at you in life, where they come from, then you're able to start like from a clean slate with that perspective for what's coming on in the future. And it just, it just opens up doors. That's amazing. So you guys are, what I'm hearing is that many of these cases, when you're working with people, they have physical health issues. And between what you're getting from spirit and what Karen, you know, she's a, a former nurse, as well as her own spiritual path, she's able to help make sense of it so that people are getting relief. I, it, to me, this is fascinating because I, even as a physician, I could tell that for some people, if they had some underlying either trauma or drama or a lack of um, forgiveness for themselves or a lack of belief or a sense of worthiness, then they wouldn't get better. It didn't matter what you threw at them. And so I love that you're able to give people like this, you know, past, present, future perspective so that they can finally like make sense of where they're going in life and then either depart this life peacefully or get the healing that they actually need. Well, people, people are so hard on themselves. And I think that's a lot of what people see in their interactions with others is maybe somebody, you say something to somebody and, 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 they, and they appear to take it too harshly or too difficult. And it's not because of how you specifically verbalize it. It's because most of the time that person is already so hard on themselves that like your little nugget of information is like just one nugget too many. Mm. And and so I, 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 I really try to find a way to help people get to that that baseline thing that and sometimes it's not it's not always I mean a lot of times it is past trauma. But a lot of times it's just past misinterpreted actions uh -huh. where, where you, you know, you, you did something and you think these are the things that happened because of that. And that's the thing that I call reverse engineering and is because 
you know, we're, we're all busy in our day-to-day lives, right? So we're only, we're only catching kind of the surface things. You know, so, somebody like myself, where I'm you know, self-employed, and I've spent hours and hours and hours really going back and really focusing on exactly the steps you can get there. But a lot of times, you know, most people that are in their daily lives, you need that external thing to come in and be like, wait a minute. That's not why that happened. This, this, you know, let's let's work a little bit deeper and find out. Well, what actually did happen when you left that job, or you left that relationship, or you moved, and that's the other thing. Um, not just not having a regret about what you did do, but this this is the big thing I talk about all the time. Let's say everybody, you're faced with two choices. You know, whether you're going to go to a movie, you're going to go to a concert. Okay, and you go to a movie. You don't have a good time. The people behind you are talking, this, that, and the other thing. What do most people say? Ah, I should have gone to the concert, right? Mm-hmm. That's the thing. If you made the assumption that you were going to have a good time at the movie and that's why you picked it, why do you assume that you're correct that the movie would have been better? So maybe by not going to the movie, you avoided some, some something horrible. Yeah. You avoided a disaster. Maybe, maybe you wouldn't have had such a good time at the at the at the concert, I should say. But the the point being is that a lot of people have regret not just for what they did, but for like a choice that they made, and they, and they think they're, they're sure that if they had chosen differently, that it would have worked out right. And I always ask them, well, if it didn't work out right with what you did choose, why do you just assume that you were right about what you didn't choose? Right. And and once people kind of see that, it frees them up from it just it just frees them up from having regret as far as you know oh I I messed up this decision I was, I, I should have done this or I should have done that and and once you get to that point then you can make the decisions that you have to make in your future a lot easier because you just like you know what I'm just I'm just a passenger I'm just along for the ride <laughs> just bring it to me what are we doing today yeah and it, really takes a lot of stress and anxiety off. Awesome. I know that's how it works. Well, I love the way you put it. It's like, okay, I'm just a passenger. Let me just roll with it, flow with it. And that's definitely the sense that I got from the, the chapter that you wrote in this book, The Top 10 Traits of Highly Resilient People. But this has been a busy year for you because in addition to our group book, you have also published a book with Karen um, about this law of attraction lifestyle. There you go. How to survive the, the 2020 election by living the law of attraction life, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, that was that was interesting. It, it all came out of this one small idea that I had. And it was, it was in the context, Karen and I were talking about things that were manifesting. Just kind of got, came up with this idea where it's like, well, you can't manifest what you want by continuing to focus on what you don't want. Okay, so if you if if you don't you can't get a, a sub sandwich by focusing on not wanting pizza. You, you're going to end up with, with pizza because that's what you're focused on. And so when I thought about it, you know, with all the with all the complications we'll call it around politics these days, and I just I was like, you know. And, and I'll, I'll preface it by saying in the book, there's about one paragraph out of the book where we talk specifically about the candidates. It, it's for whoever, whoever your candidate is, the book applies the same way. But this is basically the same logic. And that is, it, it, and you can go back all the way to the previous presidents. Whoever is getting the most attention, regardless of it's positive or negative, that's who's winning the election. And so, what, you know, the purpose initially of the book was kind of along the lines of, hey, you know, if, if you want your candidate to win, to take it from a positive point of view, mm-hmm. if you want your candidate to win, just focus on what they're good at. Focus on 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 being positive about your candidate. Because, you, you like, you see all the signs. And it'll say, no to this one, and no that, and no this, and no that. And it's like, well, the universe doesn't see the no part. Right. Right? It just sees the name. It just sees the focus on that object, the, the no part doesn't mean anything in the universe. 
So we kind of, and then we, we took it, that concept, and we kind of extrapolated it into, well, how can we take law of attraction principles and apply it to the election and the election process and the campaigning and, and the rallies and everything and, and take it from a point of view of, okay, if you can figure out how to, um, not manipulate, I'm lost for the word, if you can figure out how to navigate the election process by using law of attraction, especially the way policies are now, you can take these principles and apply it to the election and come out peaceful. You're set because those principles will apply to the rest of your life. And the rest of your life, for the most part, a lot of things are going to be a lot easier than dealing with the election stresses that, you know, it's just we're all bombarded with it, right? You can't, you can't go on social media. I don't care what group you're on. Yeah. I mean, I'm on sports groups. And somehow everybody always <laughs> finds a way to turn it to politics. And yeah. So you can find a way... And that's what the book helps you do. There's a question and answer section where we list out, uh, I think, I don't know, 15, 20 questions for you to answer before you read the book and after you read the book. Oh. It kind of uses the same techniques that Karen and I will use with our clients, and, and that is to kind of really have you ask yourself these deeper questions that you really haven't thought about in terms of why do I have these particular political views because let's face it a lot of the times by the time we're 18 we already have a lot of these views already you know set so where did that come from mm. you know, and get there and then you know and and and, and the, the purpose is not to change anybody's mind the purpose of the questions are to make for each individual to make sure that the decisions that they've made are their own and not because they've received input from somebody else Awesome. Well, I love that it's going to have long-lasting ramifications. It's not just about the 2020 election. It's about really learning how to use the law of attraction in other areas of your life and get through the election with peace. So exactly. I love it. Well, Eric, once again, thank you so very much for contributing to this book and sharing your gifts with the world. I'm super excited to see what's coming next. I know 2020 is going to be um, full of excitement for, for you, for us, for, for the world. So thank you. Thank you very much for having me, Dre. I much, this, this, this was a lot of fun. I really appreciate it. I'm glad. Well, there you have it, my friends. You can pick up a copy of the book, The Top 10 Traits of Highly Resilient People, so that you can read Eric's story about resilience. And as he mentioned, you can also get Surviving the 2020 Election by Living the Law of Attraction Life. Check it out on Amazon. And the links will be around this video. Until we meet again, my friends, remember that you are a gift to the world. So share your presence with passion. Much love. Bye. Thank you.